Good morning, everyone. Okay, we gotta, we'll work up to it. It's good to see you all today. You know what a special day today is? Allison Johnson is with us today. And Jules, her husband, is with her. Sorry. I've run out of things to say when I get up here, so that's what I do. It's good to see you all this morning. We are back in the book of Luke this morning as we look in chapter 21 as Jesus teaches us about a very popular thing, which is the end times. Jesus tells us right from his own mouth exactly how everything is going to go down when it all rolls up, when the world comes to an end. And I don't know about you, but I've been thinking more about that recently. And I think we're getting closer and closer. But we'll take a look at the words of Jesus and see if any of it squares up with history or with things that we see forming even now in our society. But let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace that it is enough for us, that we can come to you in our broken, sinful condition and that, Lord, you promise to rebuild us from within that you make us new. We're so grateful for that, Lord, that sin and our physical propensities don't hold us bound anymore, but you've freed up our will so that we can serve you. I pray by your spirit you'd help us today to understand your words, that you'd help us to take it to heart, that you might edit our lives, that you would help us, Lord, with all of our heart to be dedicated to do your will with peace and with love and with truth. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys know where you are. I'm, I'm going to call this part of the chapter the final countdown because I have the song in my mind. Some of you who are as old as me remember the song. It was probably a one-hit wonder, but so, and I won't attempt to do it. I, I'll spare you that. This is the week of Jesus' life from the time that he comes into Jerusalem and they lay palms out, which is called Palm Sunday, and everybody says, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they're quoting the Psalms, and they're recognizing Jesus to be the Messiah and hoping that he will come and assume the place of authority on the throne of his father David, even as the Romans have occupied Jerusalem. And Jesus is there for a week, and it happens to be the period of time in which he would look over the Passover lamb and make sure that it is perfect in every respect, and you have four days to do that. Once doing that, then your lamb was acceptable, and you could make a sacrifice for sin, placing your hands upon its head and having the priest sacrifice it beneath your very hands. Can you imagine? And yet God did something for us by sending his son, that he was the lamb of God. He was the one sacrifice for all of our sin, and by faith in Jesus Christ that we're freed. Amen? Amen. Just making sure you're the same people I knew you were. So last week, we looked at the beginning of chapter 21. First of all, it was Mother's Day, and I tried not to embarrass you mothers. But it says here that Jesus looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor woman putting in two mites, which is a very, very small amount of money. And Jesus said she gave more than everybody else because she gave out of her need. It wasn't out of her excess where all the rich people were pouring into their excess. And I think maybe I fall into that category more often than not. I don't give Jesus out of my necessity. I don't give to God out of the things I need to eat. I, I, would I give up a meal? I pray I would. And in the end of it was verse five and six, which is Jesus says, as some spoke in the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And we know that Jesus is speaking forward into history about 70 AD when Rome came in and they besieged the temple. It was a three-day siege. And on the final day, they... Uh, they set it on fire accidentally. Uh, one of uh, Titus Vespasian's um, soldiers set it on fire by accident and melted all the gold in the temple. And so all of the Romans, after killing about a million people that day, 
started disassembling the temple and taking every stone apart and digging the gold out from between it. And so the words of Jesus were exactly fulfilled just as he said it would be. He said it with sorrow in his heart because the disciples, we understand from one of the other gospels, were the ones who were saying, isn't this beautiful, this wonderful white marble structure and isn't it magnificent, the work of man's hands? And Jesus said, yeah, but it's really nothing because it's going away very soon, within one generation. Within 38 years of Jesus speaking this, it was gone. So this week, it's the final countdown. And I can't say it without the song going off in my head. There it is. I, I have been a stumbling block, forgive me. Beginning in verse 7. And so they asked him, this is after he told them about the stones not being left on another. And so they asked him, teacher... But when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, take heed. Do not be deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. The time is drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first. But the end will not come immediately. And then he said to them, nation will ri rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake and will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in stars, and in the earth's distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and its waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up. And lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. And when they're ready, budding, you see and you know yourselves that summer is now near. And so you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, that that day may come unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell in the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape 
all of these things that will come to pass than to stand before the Son of Man. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, and at night, he went out and he stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all of the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So it's a rather large section of scripture, but I'm going to try to sum up as best as I can. I'm not able to dig down deep to all of the references and get into Daniel and a lot of the prophecies about the end times and how they might come together. But we're going to look at the Luke passage and do a little bit of reference to a couple of the other ones. So it begins by the disciples, we understand, asking him inside the temple as they were remarking these beautiful stones and decorations. And he says, you think this is good, huh? There's not one that's going to be left on another. And so we know that he's speaking from the inside the temple, and we know that he taught there in the daytime. But at night, he went to the Mount of Olives, and he kind of camped out with his disciples. And so they asked him, teacher, when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? So there are two questions that they ask. Now, most of you are familiar with the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, and most people equate them to be the same exact passage, but they're not. Because like many famous pastors, Jesus says the same thing at different times and emulsifies and adds to it depending on his audience. Right here, he's speaking and teaching to the people inside the temple, and he's doing this during the daytime in the presence of these stones. The question they ask is, when? That's a good question, isn't it? And there are a lot of people that think they have the answer. I, I know when Jesus is coming. He's coming when he feels like it. So don't persecute me. They're asking the same question. When will these things, and what will be the sign that these things are about to take place? So how can we know that this is happening? What are, what are the, the things that will be in place in our world that we'll be able to recognize this? It seems like a very simple question, right? When, and how are we going to know? Uh, you guys want to know when and how you can know? Well, we just read it. You should know. I'm sorry. In Matthew 24, the, what's called the Olivet Discourse, a lot of people equate it to be the same sermon. But here's what he says. Matthew 24, 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things, when will these things be? And here's the catch because his disciples ask another question. And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? It's important to know what answer Jesus gives because you have to know what question he's answering. These are two different questions. When and how do we know? When and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Those are two different questions. One was with his disciples. And we know that it was Peter and Andrew and John and James. And that's listed in the book of Mark. So it's a different conversation, probably just after this one, as they walk back, they want to get some more information other than what they heard. But we're going to be looking at Luke's account, which is largely to Gentile audience. Matthew's is largely to a Jewish audience. So it's going to be a bit different because I believe there are two different occasions because of that twist right there. See, in Mark 13, it says, and now he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of the things that will be fulfilled at the end of the age? So Mark gives us that. So this is Jesus having a private conversation with his disciples in Matthew 24, but Jesus is teaching in the temple courts here in Luke so that you know that they're different. And he said, take heed that you're not deceived for many will come in my name saying, I am he, meaning the Christ. And the time is drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. You watch a lot of CNN? Don't be terrified. You watching what's going on over there in Ukraine? Don't be terrified. Jesus said this. When you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first. But the end will not come immediately. So this, this is the prelude. Then he said to them, nation 
will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. This is kind of an encapsulated breakdown that Jesus is giving us from beginning to end. And we'll look at it. These are some signs that you can look for, but these aren't really the signs of the end. These are the signs that we're approaching the end because the end doesn't come immediately. There's going to be a great deception. There are going to be a lot of people who fall away, and the scriptures tell us that. A lot of people who claim to know Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, those people will fall away because they're, you know, there's three kind of believers, right? There's, there's a believer, there's an unbeliever, and then there's a make-believer. And the make-believers will show their true colors at some point. There's going to be a great deception. There are going to be false Christs, people that rise up. There'll be wars and rumors of wars or commotions between nations. Nation will rise against nation. The word actually is ethnos. It's people of de different ethnicities will rise up against each other. Does that sound familiar? And kingdom against kingdom. That's actually nation states will rise up against each other. Earthquakes, famines and pestilences, fear, full sights and great signs from heaven. The, the sun and the moon that will be darkened and stars will fall from the sky. We know from the book of Revelation and all of that, which I won't get too far into, but I'd love to. Matthew 24, eight says, and all these are the beginnings of sorrows. So all of what is listed here is the beginning of sorrow. So it's not like, oh, we've reached the end. We're there. You know, uh, I always think of underdog when I think this is the end. But these are the beginning of sorrows. As many prophecies, these are for now and for a future fulfillment. There are a lot of passages which talk about now, and it's talking about something that's going to happen now because God works in these shadows and types all throughout the Old Testament. You guys know that, just, just nod. There are all of these wonderful maps, if you will, in the Old Testament that show us this is what's going to happen in the future and those things like Antiochus Epiphany, setting himself up uh, basically like God and putting Zeus into the temple and uh, demanding that everybody bow down and worship and you know, nobody's allowed to worship on Sunday or you get killed, uh, nobody's allowed to rest or get circumcised. Uh, this is 300 BC. This guy who's a picture of the Antichrist comes so we, we hear the story about that and we understand, wow, you know, that's not speaking about just now, it's talking about the future. So there are all those kind of things with prophecy. It's something that's meant for the people that are there, but it also alludes to something much further. Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, I want you to go to a mountain where I tell you and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And you go, well, that's a crazy thing. God doesn't require human sacrifice. All of that was written for our learning. And so when Jesus comes and God actually fulfills that which Abraham did not, and he sacrifices his only son, we, we understand that and we go, aha, right? No? He says, this is the beginning of sorrows. And if you look in the Matthew 24 passage in the Luke 21, and also in Revelation chapter six, you will see that they all are right in line. They all parallel each other. If you, if you look at the... Um, if you look at the seals, and I, I wish I could get into Revelation, but I won't. But you will see that these are exact parallels. So Jesus is paralleling everything that has already been said. And before all these things, they will lay your hand, their hands on you and persecute you. So Jesus talked about all of these things, but he said before this, and so you have to kind of, when you're drawing a timeline, you have to stop and you have to go back and put a, what Jesus is about to say before that on a timeline. Does that make sense? It might be confusing, but he says before all these things, because this is what they're going to need to know right now. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see all of these things occurred. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, Paul was brought before Caesar. You will see all of these people were brought before not just religious trials, but also secular trials for my name's sake. And it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. If you read the book of Acts, you see all of that actually happens. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom in which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Jesus speaking to the people there in the temple saying, don't think about what you're going to say. 
How would you like a test like that? Didn't you love that when the teacher would pop out with a test that was completely unannounced? You didn't have a chance to study. It's probably a better test to see if you learned something. But I hated that because I wasn't a good learner in school. But Jesus says, if you're going to go up, when this happens, don't think about what you're going to say. How hard is that to do? Don't think about your, if somebody said, listen, you're going to be preaching on Sunday, but don't prepare anything. You'd fire me right away. I know you would. So Jesus is saying before all these things, you're going to be arrested, persecuted. You're going to fall into judgment. There's going to be incarceration. You're going to have court dates where you're going to have to go before these people. And that will be an opportunity for you to tell people about me, Jesus says. And don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't think about it. Don't have a practice defense. Make sure that your lawyer doesn't coach you and tell you, this is exactly what you should said. Use these exact words and don't use any other words and just shut up. Jesus said, don't worry about it. I will. Who's going to give you the words? Jesus will give you the words. Jesus will give How can he claim to give you the words? He's dead, isn't he? But he's risen from the dead and he's alive. And he is God, the son. And that's why Jesus will give you the words. Otherwise, that would be a silly thing to write if he wasn't God. I will give you a mouth of wisdom in which your adversaries will not be able to contradict and resist. So we know that this happens. And if you look through the book of Acts, we have a, a wonderful explanation of all of those things which occur, especially with Peter and, and John and um, Paul, especially. All of the disciples afterwards, the Fox's Book of Martyrs explains all of the persecutions of the Christian church. And we're seeing a resurgence of that today, uh, simply because Roe v. Wade is uh, on the brink of being overturned. And there are a lot of people throwing riots in front of Supreme Court justices' homes and uh, burning and throwing Molotov cocktails into uh, planned pregnancy centers where people are actually coming in to get, um, you know, checked out and decide to keep their babies. People have gone violent. And it's absolutely crazy. And if you look at the news, they're blaming white Christians. Me. It's my fault. Apparently. Sorry. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. By the way, this is before Judas Iscariot turns Jesus in. You think that was a surprise? Absolutely. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. For your, by your patience, possess your souls. Interesting. He says, some of you guys are going to die. You're going to get assassinated. You're going to get killed for your faith. He says that. But then he says, not a hair of your head will be harmed. You see, the Bible can't be true. You're such a good group. Listen, if you lose your life, did you lose anything? Listen, you might die, but you won't lose. You might die, but you won't perish. I think that's what Jesus is saying. In Matthew 24, 10 to 13, and many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. When lawlessness abounds, in other words, when the law doesn't mean anything and you let people break it and there's no enforcement or at least not equal enforcement, what's that cause to happen? People throw off restraint. I don't know about you, but in the last several years, people have gotten worse at driving. You notice that? I see more people going through stop signs, going through red lights, doing crazy things, cutting people off, maniac things. And it's not just Jersey. I know it's everywhere else too. Because laws are not respectable in the eyes of people anymore. So, well, for some people, you'll, you'll get prosecuted. Other people, they could do whatever they want. When lawlessness abounds, when suddenly it's okay for so-and-so to get away with it, guess what happens to everyone? 
everyone feels like, well, why would I, why am I going to be obedient? Right? I remember thinking about stopping at the stop sign down here in the corner, and I thought, what a stupid thing I'm concerned about stopping at a stop sign when Russia has invaded the Ukraine. <laughs> and I had to punch that in the face and put it down and say, no, I need to stop. You don't know if somebody's going to cross here. You, you better stop. So anyway, when lawlessness, when lawlessness abounds and people go crazy, the love of many will grow cold. It's already hard to continue loving somebody that you have to forgive and show grace to. But it gets even harder when they just trample over any law. So Mark 8, 36 and 37 says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I find it interesting that Jesus interposes this here. And he says, by your patience, possess your souls. You have been given the guardianship of your soul, which, by the way, is the most important thing you can do. Your relationship between you and God and possessing your soul in a right way so that you don't expose yourself to undue trouble, that you don't expose yourself to sin. There are things that you can't unsee, and there are things that you can't undo. The greatest the, the greatest discipleship that you will ever practice is the discipleship of your own soul. And Jesus says, by patience, keep your head, control yourself, possess your own soul. That make sense? When you all get stiff like this, I don't know. So forgive me. Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you you see i take that very very seriously that i am a shepherd of souls that's a pretty heavy responsibility if you're a parent you shepherd souls if you're an employer to some degree you shepherd souls if you have any responsibility to anybody who is under your authority you are a shepherd. You have a responsibility for the souls of those people. So if they're going off, you know, like if the bridge is out and they're, they're driving full speed heading somewhere, metaphorically speaking, and you don't say anything, how are you loving their soul? You should tell them. Tell them the truth. Tell them they're headed for trouble. The bridge is out. Make sense? Sometimes the most loving thing you could do is, is face off with somebody and say, listen, you're doing the wrong thing. And that's an expression of love, as long as you do it with compassion. Jesus says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that the desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jesus says, and 38 years from the time Jesus says this, it actually happens. In 70 AD, Titus Vespasian, actually Vespasian, his father, comes and goes against Jerusalem and they set up a siege. And in the middle of that, Nero dies. And he says, well, this is my chance to go take the big chair. And so Vespasian leaves and he leaves all of these armies around Jerusalem, but they're all kind of like camping out now. They're not sieging Jerusalem. And so he goes back and he actually sees his power to become Caesar. And he tells his son via a message Make sure you finish the job. And that's when they siege Jerusalem again and a million Jews are killed. And a fire breaks out and then they, every stone comes down off another. And he goes, you will know that this is happening when you see armies surround Jerusalem, which is exactly what happened. Except they kind of bivouacked for a while. 
And a lot of the Christians who understood what Jesus said, got the heck out of Dodge, left, and they went to Pella. And there are writings, and we have historic writings from there, that not one single Christian died in Pella because they were told by Jesus, when you see this happening, get out of Jerusalem. If you're on your roof, don't go down, get your coat, don't do anything, get out of Jerusalem. And so they did. And everybody who was obedient and left, they lived. So Jesus gave us some really good information here and we see how it falls. And I love Jesus's compassion in the middle of this. And he goes, oh my goodness, woe to those who are pregnant in those days and nursing. You see his compassion. He's like, this is going to happen, but oh man, it's going to be really hard for certain people groups. It's just going to be difficult. And he's got compassion as he mentions that. This is actually called the Arch of Titus, which depicts them looting the temple and uh, this was something that Titus was very proud of, and, and they memorialized him by putting it up there. And you can see the menorah and all of the other instruments of worship that they had gotten from the temple, along with, you know, sacks full of gold that they had um, ransacked between the stones. You remember Jesus coming to Jerusalem before Palm Sunday, and, and he was weeping while everyone was cheering, and he was weeping over Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen. He says this before going in. He says, therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That's exactly what happens in the book of Acts. And on you may come all the righteous shed blood, blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Yeah, that actually happened. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And it's interesting because the generation is 40 years, right? In, in biblical standards, it happens 38 years later, exactly as Jesus said. So Luke 19, 41 says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And you, they will not leave with you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus says the reason in 70 AD everything fell down is because they refused to hear Jesus. And he wept about that fact. You should never be glad when there's a downfall of people. That's God's doing and you should let God have that and we shouldn't rejoice so much on it. And there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. These are the cosmic signs, okay? Jesus is giving us a timeline. He began talking and he says, but before that, this is going to happen. Now what he does is he goes forward in time and talks about these cosmic signs that will happen. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and its waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Any of you know about that? That hasn't happened yet. You'd know about that. And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And now then these things begin to happen. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. There's a new movie out called Moonfall. It explores the idea of um, something actually forcing the moon into the earth which it sounds a lot like what Jesus is talking about. There'll be signs in the sun in the moon and in the stars. Before, seven years before Jerusalem was destroyed, they said that there was a giant sword in the sky. It was, a, you know what a, a comet looks like when it goes into the atmosphere, right? And it leaves this trail. That's what happened. There was a comet and it happened just before Jerusalem was taken down. There was a sign in the sky that's strange. Seven years before Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD, Pompeii is completely covered in ash. 
I find it amazing that the things that happened then also will happen soon. Jesus predicts that it will happen even as it has happened. And he says, when you see these things happen and the stars and the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and its waves roaring. Well, you know what? You, you start to move the moon or you get a solar flare. You know, there are a lot of people saying that they're going to be solar flares are going to disrupt all our electronics and all that. Have you seen that? Sounds like a conspiracy theory to me. Until Jesus says it first. And then I say, hmm, I'm going to keep my eyes open because that's what he tells me to do anyway. And waves. That tells me that there's going to be some kind of a cosmic disturbance and everything is going to bust loose. It sounds like nuclear war. It sounds like people will be petrified and be clutching their heart for fear of death. Sounds like nuclear war to me. It would upset the orbit of the earth or the moon and suddenly waves out of nowhere would become incredible. Yeah, that, 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 sounds, that sounds very plausible. I imagine to the people Jesus was speaking to, it sounded crazy. To us, it's a whole lot more reasonable, isn't it? And then he spoke to them a parable. Like, like a little commercial in the middle of his conversation. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a parable. And he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. By the way, some people say that this is expressly Jerusalem, but uh, because he says it, all the trees, and Luke gives us that, which is helpful. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they're already budding, you see and know that yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So look at the fig tree. When the fig tree begins to come out and it starts to develop little buds and then blossoms and then finally leaves and fruit eventually, you know that summer's coming. You know that it's right around the corner. So it will be with these signs. Understand when these things begin to happen, lift up your head because your redemption draws near, Jesus said. And know that these things are going to happen. Jesus' word will not change. The heaven and the earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. And we bank on that. In Matthew 24, Jesus stating this again and a little bit of addition. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when the branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Which generation is he talking about? The generation he's just speaking of that sees these things. The sun, the moon, the stars. When you see these things, you're not, you're not going to die before you see the end. These people are going to see it come upon them. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. And he adds this. But of the day and the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, but my father only. And I'm glad he did that because he's answering their question, isn't he? When will these things happen? Well, here are the signs. I'm not going to give you a date. Because there's something that Jesus didn't know that the Father did. Isn't that interesting? And if you look in the book of Revelation, the very first, the beginning of it, it says, this is the revelation that the Father gave to Jesus Christ. Jesus at that point in his resurrected state knew all things. But he was limited when he was here in his humanity. I just little theological tidbit. But the day and the hour, no one knows. So if anybody tells you it's going to happen, I know I figured it out. I used my, my noggin and my calculator and my abacus. I got it all figured out. You can tell them, listen, hold tight, because once that day passes and comes, I don't want you to be too disappointed. And you know, a lot of people have been deceived that way. I mean, there are a lot of people who follow people like Harold Camping and Jehovah's Witnesses have predicted at least six times that he was coming. It's, it's not good to do what Jesus says you can't do. No one knows the day or the hour. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life, that the day may come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face 
of the whole earth. It's going to be a surprise for all those who are left on the face of the planet. So don't be an earth dweller. But it says here, take heed to yourselves. By the way, that's to us. Take heed that you don't get all twisted up, that you don't get weighed down with worry. You know what worry is? Worry is I don't trust God. Worry is I don't believe his word. Worry is I don't have a good, good father. He doesn't love me. He's not going to save me because of what Jesus did. That's what worry is. Worry is a lack of faith. That's fear. Jesus expressly says here, take heed to yourselves. Maintain your souls with patience, as he said earlier. Lest your hearts, which is the seat of your emotions, be weighed down with carousing. Actually, I looked up this word. It actually means a hangover. It is the lasting effects of drinking too much alcohol where you have a headache. That's actually the original Greek word. So I'm not sure carousing is a really good interpretation because we usually think carousing is kind of wandering around looking for trouble. But this is, make sure that you don't get yourself mired into the things of this world and try to cope with some substance that isn't going to help you. It's just going to give you a headache and you're still going to be afraid when you wake up in the morning. Make sense? And in a world where it says, you know, you can have a perfect life through, you know, pharmacological means or alcohol, don't believe them. Don't be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. Like, what am I going to do with my money? They actually found a giant cache of coins buried in the ground just outside of Jerusalem on the road leaving Jerusalem towards Pella. Some Christian probably leaving town because they can tell from the imprint on the money has buried all of their stuff by the roadside thinking I'll come back for this if I need it sometime. And they left and did exactly what Jesus said. They got out of town. Well, they just recently found all these coins. They opened up this cloth that it was wrapped in under the ground and it was actually in a ceramic container. It was amazing. Uh, anyway, I should have these for pictures for you. I, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Next time. Don't get weighed down with the cares of this world. Don't worry about your stuff. Don't, don't get twisted up and get attached to the things of this world because it's all going away, right? Whatever it is that you think you can spend money on and you like to have or collect in your house or maybe you've got a hoarding issue or, you know, whatever, it's not going gonna, not gonna to last. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell in the face of the whole earth. It's coming for everyone. There's no one going to be exempt from it. And of course, if you begin to look at what's going on here on the earth, you can get incredibly depressed and, and just shrink and just weep in your hands and say, there's nothing I can do. This is way bigger than me. What do you think the Lord would have you do? Pray. Absolutely pray. Pray always that you may be counted. I'm sorry. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all the things that will come to pass. Did you know that there's an escape from all these things that are going to pass? Now, if you're a, if you're a post-tribulationist, you can't believe that. that. Worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and he stayed in the mount called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Jesus says that we should watch and pray always. If Jesus said it, I, I think we should be doing it, right? I don't know about you, but I, I need to get on that boat more often than I do. And number two, there is a way of escape. I'm here to give you the good news. The bad news is we deserve all the stuff that's going to happen because we've earned it by our behavior. The good news is Jesus came and took away the punishment that I deserve so that I might have a life in him. Amen? Amen. I hope you believe that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That sounds incredibly exclusive, doesn't it? I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
No, not every road, doesn't matter what Oprah says. Not every road leads to God. You can do your own thing. You got your own truth, bananas. It's bananas. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus says this, and it's an invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke or my load upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus gives the picture of getting in the stocks with him and carrying things with him side by side because he's going to carry the load, isn't he? He says, come and learn from me. And so as we do that, we put ourselves under his authority. We submit our lives to him and say, Lord, I give up my will. I give up my plans. I give up my life. I've made a mess of it. I was a, I was a, a heap of, of human confusion before I came to Jesus. The Lord came into my life and he changed me and now I'm standing up here talking to you people. That's a, that's a big miracle, okay? And he can do it for each one of us. We so need him, especially in this time because I don't think we have a lot of time left over. I think we're running out of time, guys. I do believe it's the final countdown. I believe it's the, we're approaching the end. We can see the signs. You, you can sense it from people around. There's now going to be persecution for Christians more and more. Don't get freaked out by it. Jesus said, don't worry about it. Don't let your hearts get crazy. Possess your soul with some patience here. These things have to happen. It's got to get worse before we go home. So let's trust him. Amen.